Universal Studio Tour. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Everyone say hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you for those of you who did Muppet Arms with me. I really appreciate it. It makes my day. Folks, I am pale, but I'm not this pale. So I'm not going to be on camera this evening. I'm so sorry. Just trust me. I'm adorable. Car one will vouch for that. Uh, but there's plenty to see out there. You don't need to look at my face. As those tram gates come down, watch your arms and legs. Get comfy. <gasps> He's here, the man of the moment. It is our driver. You recognize him as the host of That's My Jam and the Tonight Show, both on NBC. And that's because it's Mr. Jim Allen. Welcome to the Universal Studio Tour. I'm Jimmy Fallon. I'll be making sure you get through this experience in one piece. You've got the very best guy. Elizabeth. And the greatest driver. Angel. You're the best. I love you. Even though Elizabeth. You bought me five bucks. Yeah. I knew you're going to be excited to get on the tour, but first, that's right, Jimmy. We do have a few safety rules. First, if you need desk assistance or have a medical emergency, or if you drop something of value off the side of the tram, or have any sound or video issues, reach up, grab the ready cord that runs along the center of the ceiling of the tram, and I'll be back to assist you as soon as it's safe to do so. Otherwise, during the entire tour, please stay seated and keep your arms and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Remember to use the red cord above your head if you need any assistance. The studio is private property, but any time during the tour, you drop your phone or can't wait to use the restroom, just pull the cord and remain seated. Please, no smoking of any kind during the tour. Be prepared. Our tour today features loud noises, sun trap movements, fire effects, and many watery effects. Don't worry, you'll only get wet tonight if you're sitting in a blue seat. You'll want to have your cameras out for great photo opportunities, but keep an eye on them so don't get wet. Finally, for your safety and those around you, please do not use selfie sticks while you're on board. All right, that's the nitty gritty out of the way. We've left the theme park behind. We are now rolling down the universal timeline. I want you all to look to your left. Look to your right. Good, about half of you passed that test. Congratulations. But as you look over to your right, you're gonna see movie posters for just some of the thousands of movies that we've produced here at Universal Studios during our nearly 109 year history. Some of them are Oscar winners like Out of Africa, Schindler's List, Beautiful Mind. We have won 10 Best Picture Academy Awards over the years, and we are crossing our fingers for an 11th this year. We do have two pictures nominated, both The Holdovers from Focus Features and Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer is leading the way with 13 nominations, and if you'd like to watch it, it is now streaming on Peacock. We don't just do the serious stuff around here, though. We also have cult classics and comedies like Blues Brothers, Breakfast Club, and Animal House. So as we keep going down the timeline, keep an eye out for your favorite Universal movie. To your right again, though, you can see Fire Station 51. Fire Station 51 is a real working fire station with real hard working firefighters. And we're glad to have them here on the lot because every so often we do have a real emergency. This is Hollywood though, so they may be the only real thing we see on today's tour. As we continue down the timeline, we're going to be heading into the front lot. The front lot is primarily sound stages, and if you don't know what a sound stage is, that's okay. I'm going to show you a ton of them, tell you all about them. Oh, you're going to be pros by the end of this tour. A sound stage is a large warehouse type building that you build your set inside of, film inside of, and it blocks in about 98% of sound, which is really great. We have construction work going on, trams going by, you don't want to hear all this nonsense, you don't want to hear me, in the background of your TV show or movie, so we film inside of sound stages like sound stage 12 over to our left. Sound stage 12 is our largest single sound stage. It's where we used to film the voice. You could probably guess that because it says the voice across the side of the south stage. The voice does still film here on the lot, but they moved into some of our newer sound stages. Because not only is sound stage 12 very large, it's also very old. It was originally built in 1929 for a movie musical called Broadway, but we filmed many of your favorite movies in there since. And to see just a few, look up on your screens. <laughs> Up on your screen, you can see 
see that empty soundstage with padding on the walls for soundproofing and then the grid on the ceilings for hanging lights. It's another reason why you may want to build inside of a soundstage. You'll have full control over lighting as well as sound. Over to our left though are two very full sound stages. Those are seven and eight. That is where they are preparing to film the third season of Bel Air. Bel Air is a modern, more dramatic retelling of Fresh Prince of Bel Air. The first two seasons are already streaming on Peacock and we're so glad to have the casting crew back for season three. If you look over to your left, you're going to see several trucks, trailers, some tents back there. This is what we call a base camp. Base camp is everything you need to get ready to be on set. So hair, makeup, wardrobe, dressing rooms for the stars. And this is a very popular location for base camps because sound stages 7, 8, and 14 have been so busy over the years, both before and after the pandemic. Before Bel Air was in these sound stages, it's where they filmed the second season of Hacks, the HBO show starring Gene Smart. Before Hacks was in there, we built Bayside High inside sound stages 7 and 8 for the revival of Saved by the Bell. And before that, 7 and 8 were the longtime home of Cloud 9, the Superstore from Superstore, the hit NBC comedy starring America Ferrera, Ben Feldman, and Mark McKinney. Now, almost everything I've mentioned so far that's been filming here on the lot has been a TV show, and we have a long history of television here at NBC Universal going back to 1939. That's when NBC made its very first live television broadcast for the opening ceremony of the World's Fair in New York. And we've been making TV ever since. Over to your right, you can see sound stages 16 and 17. This is where they filmed the fourth season of Mindy Kaling's show, Never Have I Ever, that streams on Netflix. It's also where we film much of Good Girls, starring Christina Hendricks, Mae Whitman, and Retta. I'm sure many of you would recognize Retta from another NBC show, Parks and Recreation. Who watched Parks and Rec? Yeah, my people. She played Donna, she taught us to treat ourselves, words to live by. Parks and Rec was created by a man named Michael Schur, a writer, writer, director. He worked on The Office. He created Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Parks and Recreation, and The Good Place, which did film over to our right in Soundstage 19. Soundstage 19 was also the home for the set of the Oval Office for Oppenheimer. So that movie did film here on the lot, and that Oval Office set was the same one they used for V. Over to our left, though, you're going to see Ted. He's raising a drink, he's celebrating, he's having a good time because Ted now has his very own TV show. It is all streaming on Peacock already, every single episode. And just like the two movies, it is created by Seth MacFarlane. So here he is to tell us a little bit more about the show. Hi everyone, Seth McFarland here, and I'm excited to share with you a behind-the-scenes look at my Peacock original event series, TED. It's a prequel series set in 1993, and that means our skilled craftspeople had to build a high school, a house, and even recreate downtown Boston as it looked back in the day using exterior sets and facades you're about to see on the tour. But I should warn you, TED is intended for mature audiences only. So grown-ups, tell the kids to go in the other room before you watch. Come on! This is the beginning of Ted's story, but production begins over to our left. You're gonna see several small brown buildings. These used to be dressing rooms to stars like Doris Day, Rock Hudson, Jimmy Stewart during that golden age of Hollywood. But of course now we use trailers for dressing rooms, so we've converted all of those buildings into office spaces called production bungalows. That's where writers, producers, directors do all of their pre-production work. Pre-production is the first part of production. It's everything that needs to happen before filming even starts. So writing, casting, budgeting, scheduling. That's what's happening over in the bungalows. Mark Platt Productions does have its own bungalow over there. And of course, they are bringing us the film versions of Wicked, the first of which is slated to come out later this year. 
to our left again though, several more offices. Those are those windows, but behind those offices are two more sound stages. These are sound stages 25 and 26, sometimes still referred to as the Willow Grace sound stages. This is where we filmed the revival of the hit Emmy Award winning TV show Will and Grace, which was a multi-cam comedy. And we have another multi-cam comedy that has made their home in Soundstage 25 on the far side there. And that's Lopez vs. Lopez, starring George Lopez, his daughter Mayan Lopez, and they co-created the show as well. Maybe you're more into those workplace comedies? I definitely keep an eye out for what they're currently filming in Soundstage 26 on this side. It's called St. Dennis Medical. It is a workplace comedy that mockumentary type that the office is uh, and that revolves around a hospital in Oregon. The very first production to film inside those sound stages though was Hairspray Live. That was in 2016 and it was important that they filmed inside those sound stages because they needed easy access to the metro sets and that's where we're heading right now. Okay, everyone, I know everything in the front lot was kind of behind closed doors, but from here on out, it's all out in the open, so get those cameras out, your phones ready. We are now in the Metropolitan Sense proper, which can be transformed into almost any city street in the world in any time period. Like this corner right here was transformed into 1960s Baltimore for Hairspray Live. But where we're rolling right now was once 1955, 1985, and 2015, all for the same film franchise. And if you recognize those three years, you know I'm talking about Back to the Future, because we are now in Courthouse Square. If you look over to your left, you can see the courthouse from Back to the Future and Back to the Future Part 2. But if you're a super fan of those movies, you're looking at me and you're going, uh, Elizabeth, that building doesn't look anything like the courthouse from Back to the future or back to the future part two and you'd be right that's because we put a new front on the building a new facade to make it less recognizable because most writers producers directors do not want you thinking about doc brown and marty mcfly when you're watching their brand new tv show or movie because there is still constantly filming going on here in courthouse square one of the scenes we just saw from ted was filmed in front of this building this was their high school if you are a fan of michael really? sure uh, who created parks and rec you watch Rutherford Falls on Peacock, the center of their small village is Courthouse Square. It's so cool to see how different productions use this area in different ways. Though it is almost always used as a small town, small town America, like Hill Valley, and I think it's time to head to the big city. So here we are turning onto New York Street. As we turn, you can look both ways down the street, and you'll notice that the street curves at both ends, giving the illusion that it goes on for blocks and blocks beyond what the eye can see. This is the longest street in the metro sets, though, and it is so long that we can set up the obstacle course for American Ninja Warrior along this street which is what we do every time we host here in LA. It is called New York Street though, because it is often used as New York City. And someone who knows a lot about New York, of course, is my co-host, Jimmy Fallon. Hey everyone, welcome to New York. I got my start right here in New York on Saturday Night Live. This is actually my old neighborhood. What's that mugged over there? An old woman, tough lady. This is my favorite hot dog guy. Hey buddy, how's it going, remember me? No. <laughs> Just like old times. Gotta love New York City. Hey! I'm walking here! I'm walking here! Hey, it's cool, guys. I was just, you know, I was just walking there. So it's not exactly New York, but a lot of times when you see New York in the movies, it was shot right here on the Universal Metro sets. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Even if you make it here on the Universal lot. New York Street can be as present day Brooklyn in episodes of Brooklyn Nine-Nine, as well as Brooklyn of the past in Marvel's Captain America First Avenger. But no matter what you're filming here on New York Street, a huge blockbuster film, a sitcom, a competition show, a commercial, you're always going to need a director. And a director we love working with here at Universal Studios is Peter Jackson. It's the original King Kong that made me want to do it. I like films that just take you away from your real life and sweep you up in the future. 
Graphics are often referred to as CGI, or Computer Generated Images or Imagery. And that's all done post-production. So there are three different parts of production. There's pre-production, which we talked about over by the bungalows. Then there's production itself, which is what we think of when we think of making a TV show or movie. So lights, camera, action, actors and actresses on set. That happens inside the sound stages, here on the back lot, or of course out on location. When you're filming on location, that's when you're filming in the real world. And then of course post-production is everything that happens after filming is done, but before the movie or TV show is ready to be seen on screen. That includes elements like those high-tech digital effects, as well as editing. Editing is a huge part of the filmmaking process. So you take those hours and hours of footage, cut it down to a two-hour movie, 22-minute sitcom, or a 20-second commercial. And that can happen here on the lot as well. We have a special building called the Verna Fields Building, named after the editor of Jaw, with all of those editing days. Now, I could go on for days about post-production and editing, but I think I need to edit my tour because it's time to shift gears and talk about picture cars. A picture car is any vehicle you see on screen, whether it's the large screen in the theater or the small screen at home. And over to your left, you can see some picture cars that are almost as famous as the actors and actresses they were seen on screen with. Most of these picture cars are gonna be from your favorite franchises like Back to the Future. Though we do have a few prehistoric picture cars from the Flintstones. We have the Flying Ford Anglia from Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets and what would a display of picture cars be without at least one from the Fast and Furious franchise? Another huge franchise we love here at Universal Studios, of course, is Jurassic World. And if you've seen Jurassic World, or even a preview for that movie, I'm sure you recognize the gyrosphere. But you may be thinking to yourself, hey, Elizabeth, there's something right. missing from that gyrosphere. The sphere itself, right? It didn't have any glass. That's because they found if there was glass in the gyrosphere while they were filming, it reflected everything. And I don't just mean the natural surroundings. I mean the cast, the crew, the lighting equipment, the camera equipment, the boom mic, everything. So they took the glass out, they did all of their filming, then they put the glass back in post-production using CGI, that's right, full circle everyone. All right, this part of the tour is for fans of the original Jurassic Park movies. Welcome to Jurassic Park. As you look to your left and right, you're gonna see sets, props, even some of the foliages from those first three Jurassic Park movies. The first of which came out in 1993, starring Laura Dern, Jeff Goldblum, and Sam Neill. All three of them did come back for Jurassic World Dominion. But again, these elements are from the Jurassic Park movies, including the mobile lab coming up on our left. This is from the second Jurassic Park movie, The Lost World Jurassic Park, starring Jeff Goldblum, Julianne Moore, and Vince Vaughn. If you look up on your screens, you can see the mobile lab in action. Ooh, speaking of the stars of Jurassic Park, it looks like a couple of them are popping up to say hello. Oh, you're so lucky. We even have a Spinosaur. She's over to your left. She's smiling for your cameras, though. She loves the paparazzi. And if you look back up on your screens, you can see the mobile lab hanging off the side of a cliff. That was not done with CGI. They really did hang that mobile lab off the side of a cliff. And we passed by that cliff at the beginning of the tour. If you didn't recognize it, though, don't feel too bad. It wasn't because it's dark, it's because it's a parking garage. So what they did is they dressed up a parking garage with real and fake foliage, making it look like a cliff, and that created a much safer, more controlled environment for this particular scene. You may also notice it's raining in this scene. Rain is a great way to raise the stakes in almost any situation. So if you want to make something more romantic, you add rain. More dramatic, you add rain. More suspenseful, you add rain. So if you want to make this tour even better, what do we have to do? Add rain. Add rain. That's right. I'm glad you all know your lines. That makes my life a lot easier. Don't worry. Your checks are in the mail. We are going to make it rain right here, right now, using what we call a practical effect. Practical effects happen during production. So in front of the camera, please do remain seated. Keep your arms and legs inside the tram. 
This is very high-tech stuff, folks. We're going to be using sprinklers. So the water shoots straight up into the air, and gravity does the rest. The lightning you're seeing is done with flash cubes. Those are on top of the buildings out of frame from camera. But the thunder you're hearing would probably be added post-production. Only about 10% of what you hear in a movie or TV show is recorded while the action is happening. It's mostly just the dialogue, what the characters are saying. Everything else you hear, like door slams, footsteps, background noise, or the rumble of a flash flood, that's all going to be added post-production by a sound engineer. And speaking of flash floods, look out, Car 3! Oh, don't worry, car one, it's coming for us too. Ooh. Ooh, don't say it didn't warn you that time. That is a very popular practical event. Not just for the studio tour, but for productions as well. Lady Gaga used it for one of her music videos for the song Judas. And she stood right there on the middle of the flash flood and the water crashed around her and all of her Gaga glory. It was great. Check it out, Lady Gaga, Judas utilize this entire portion of the back lot for that music video. It's called Old Mexico. It's also where they film portions of Three Amigos, starring Chevy Chase, Steve Martin, and Martin Short. More recently, though, it's been used for several sci-fi series like Westworld, Picard, and our very own revival of Quantum Leap, starring Raymond Lee. We are saying adios to Old Mexico, though, and out into the Old West as we mosey at the Six Points. Six Points is one of the oldest portions of the back lot, and it dates back to the silent film era. It's called Six Points because originally there were six streets that radiated up from a central point, and on each one of those streets was everything you needed for a western, so a bank, a jail, a saloon, a sheriff's office, and we could film several movies at the same time because you didn't have to worry about gunshots overlapping. They were silent films. In fact, Carl Lundley, the founder of Universal Studios, would invite the general public, people like you, out to watch him make his movies, and they would cheer for the heroes and boo for the villains, because they weren't recording any sound. Still a very relevant part of the back lot, though, and anyone who's seen Quentin Tarantino's then feature film Once Upon a Time in Hollywood has seen these sets on screen. So we had Leonardo DiCaprio, Brad Pitt, Timothy Olyphant, and Julia Butters out here while they were filming that movie. We are about halfway through the tour though, everyone. So just a quick reminder to please stay seated during the entire tour. Again, the studio is private property, and if you drop your phone or can't wait to use the restroom, just pull the right cord to get my attention. I will be back to assist you, but please do remain seated on the tram. We may have started with silent films when we opened our doors in 1915, but of course now, almost everything records sound. We cannot build sound stages fast enough. As we turn out of six points here, we are going to see some of our newest sound stages. They're going to be off to the left as we turn the corner. Across Park Lake, you'll see sound stages 30 through 34. These are the state-of-the-art sound stages where we film The Voice, currently revving up for the 25th season, if you can believe that. And these aren't even our newest sound stages anymore. We've built even more over by Barn Road. Also to the left, though, through the trees and shrubbery there, you can get a peek at Park Lake. Park Lake is a body of water that we transformed into the Amazon River for Creature from the Black Lagoon, one of our classic monster movies. We love our monster movies here at Universal Studios. They were really our bread and butter during the 30s and 40s. They put us on the map. They kept us in business during the Great Depression. We cannot talk enough about them. We are now heading to Little Europe, which is where we filmed almost all of our classic monster movies because we could transform it into a different country just by changing the language on the street signs and the shop signs. As we enter though you're going to see a different kind of sign is over to our right. It's bright green and it says welcome to the good place. Where are my good place fans? Yes, this is for you. So, this is their afterlife neighborhood. It's going to be the yogurt shops, the clam chowder fountain, the exterior of Chidi's apartment. If none of those words make sense to you, it's okay. I have a clip. It's going to give you a little bit of context. You, Eleanor Shellstrom.
fight at. Come on. This location, the afterlife, come on. I have never ever seen this. You're in the good place. I'm not supposed to be here. Over to your left, you can see a green grassy area that's fenced in. That's where they had all of their neighborhood meetings. This is the corner where they learned to fly. You can see a sign is still up over there on the building that says all chocolate everything. But of course, one of the most well-known locations is going to be that original yogurt shop you see up on your screen. And that is the building almost directly in front of us. It's gonna be off to the left as we take the fork. Further to the left, you can kind of see that clam chowder fountain. But the yogurt shop has the, the doors, the awnings here to our left. So building on your screen, building to your left. For a while, they still have the menu up inside that building with yogurt flavors like full cell phone battery. If you are familiar with the show, again to the left, you can see the railway station. That's where they got the train to the medium place and the bad place going to the bad place. Well, maybe it's not all that bad. Okay. How can I help you? What is the bad place like? Well, it doesn't sound awesome. If you've never seen The Good Place before, I highly recommend it. It's very bingeable, only four seasons long. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll love Maya Rudolph even more than you already do. I know you don't think it's possible, but it is. Go check out The Good Place. Long before Little Europe was ever the afterlife, though, it was Cairo for The Mummy, Transylvania for Dracula, Wales for The Wolfman, and Paris for Hunchback of Notre Dame. Hunchback of Notre Dame was one of our earliest monster movies, and it just celebrated 100 years since its first release this past September. So it originally came out in theaters September 6th, 1923. It's not just Universal Studios that use these sets though. Any production company can come out here and rent the different areas of the back lot. And Disney has used Little Europe several times over the years for movies like Pirates of the Caribbean, Princess Diaries 2, A Royal Engagement, which was written by Shonda Rhimes, and does anybody remember the made-for-TV version of Cinderella, Frank Brandy, Whoopi Goldberg, and Whitney Houston? Yes, my tour is for you. Uh, so yeah, if you haven't seen it, go home, watch it. It's iconic, and you'll recognize Little Europe. You can see that we're back in our Western sets, though, which were also used by Disney for Saving Mr. Banks, that making of Mary Poppins movie, the flashback scenes to early 20th century Australia. Some of that was filmed right here on our Universal backlot. But of course, they were used for our Western movies first, and that's kind of the beginning of our history here at Universal Studios. We had Western movies, then we transitioned to monster movies, then in the 70s, we transitioned again into disaster movies. I don't know what it is about Universal Studios, but we just love keeping audiences on the edge of their seats. Speaking of being on the edge of your seats, please do remain seated. Hold on to those belongings because we are going to be right up against the water here. We don't want to drop anything in the drink. Uh, don't worry though, we caught the shark. He's hanging out. Officer George is out there doing one last sweep of the water. Hopefully it'll get warm soon. We can all go swimming again. Uh, but as you look around, I know it's a little hard to see, but as you look at these sets, some of them say Cabot Cove and some... Oh. Oh no, I, I think there's another shark in the water. No, 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 you don't understand that. I'm pretty sure Officer George is still out there. Does that do... Oh, there he is. Okay, everyone on the count of three, we're gonna call out to George, okay? One, two, three, George! That was terrible. Try again. One, two, three, George! Oh, I really don't think he's Uh-oh. Uh, it's only a flesh wound. We're gonna keep moving. Nothing to see here. And we're gonna hang out behind these barrels of... Uh, what does that say? Gasoline. Cool, 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 cool. I'm sure it's gonna be all right. No worries, everyone. But as I was saying, when you look at some of the signs, some of them say... Ooh. Oh, I do. Yeah, he's right there. Okay, I don't know what's happening with the dock now, but that's not part of the plan. We may have to call it in. Oh!
They named him Bruce after director Steven Spielberg's attorney, but they wanted to film on the East Coast on location. So they shipped Bruce across the country, they put Bruce in the water, and Bruce broke almost immediately. They were able to get some footage. They made the movie, but they had a lot of problems with that production. And here to tell us a little bit more about their trials and tribulations, here's the cast and crew of Jaws. Wherever you were on the island, you could hear the radio and They were always saying, We just waited around. We just waited and waited and waited. The shark worked well enough for a while there had to be some time. So I really only tried a lot. The shark did work well enough, and Jaws was wildly successful. Not only was it the very first summer blockbuster, but it has several sequels. So there's Jaws, Jaws 2, Jaws 3D, Jaws the Revenge! There was even a point where we handed the franchise over to the fine folks at National Lampoon, the comedic geniuses who brought us Animal House, and they wrote a Jaws script. It's called Jaws 3 People Zero. They never made the movie, though, and I, for one, am still very disappointed about it. All right, we do have practical effects like Jaws up there on your screen, but we also have something called practical sets. A practical set is a set you can film both inside of and outside of, like a real building. And over to your right, as we go up the hill here, you can see the chicken ranch. This is a practical set that was originally built inside of Soundstage 12. You can see it up on your screen for the movie Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, starring Dolly Parton and Burt Reynolds. To your left, you are going to see the entrance to Colonial Street. We cannot go down Colonial Street today. It is prepped for production, but honestly, we hardly ever get to go down Colonial Street because it has several practical sets and shells that make it look like a classic American suburb. So uh, it's almost always closed for production. People love filming down there. Uh, even if you've never seen Colonial Street on a tour before, though, I can almost guarantee that between movies, TV shows, commercials, and music videos, almost everyone on the tram has seen Colonial Street at some point in their lives on screen, especially if you've ever watched an episode of Desperate Housewives. Colonial Street is Wisteria Lane. ABC filmed all eight seasons of their hit show here on the Universal lot. They've also filmed Ted down there, Quantum Leap down there, Bel Air down there, Never Have I Ever down there. If anybody watched Candy Cane Lane this holiday season, the Amazon Prime movie starring Eddie Murphy and Tracy Ellis Ross, their street was Colonial Street. I do want to show you a couple of more examples though so you can see what Colonial Street looks like. Just look up on those screens. <laughs> why a production may choose to film on Colonial Street as opposed to in a real neighborhood. One of those reasons, the road is much narrower down that street, so you can film both sides of the street in the same shot. We saw several examples of that on your screen in those clips. It's also, you can do whatever you want to those houses. You saw a scene where they set one on fire, they threw something out the window. You don't want to do that to somebody's real home in the suburbs. Now I am going to introduce you to somebody who taught us just how scary the suburbs can be with his movie Get Out. And of course I mean Academy Award winning writer and director Jordan Peele, creator of Get Out, Us, and his most re recent film, No. 
Yeah, yeah. Really Movie magic only happens when a team of collaborators, often in the hundreds, work together to take an impossible notion and bring it to life. This is Jupiter's Grin, a nostalgic, small-time Southern California amusement park owned by former child star Ricky G. Park. Over there, I'm looking to the Winky Lab, and have your picture taken just like the kids in that old 90s movie Kid Share. That's what this whole place is loosely based on. Remember that one? No? Why? Well, a little further down, you can see the brand new Star Lasso Experience. Built to showcase an unbelievable new live show. It's not looking so live anymore. Anyway, behind this Hollywood fantasy of a gold rush frontier town lies a sinister secret. It is smack dab in the center of the U of Monopoly. Welcome to the world of the world. Santa Clarita. That's where they filmed these portions of the movie, but we wanted to be able to share them with all of you, so we took down the sets, transported them here, and then rebuilt them much closer together here on the back lot. All right, everyone, I have talked so much about how we make movies. Now it's time to put you all into the movies. So here's the situation. One person on the tram is an undercover witness. Don't say if it's you. You're undercover. The rest of us have to keep that person safe from Owen Shaw. We're heading into Sullivan's Garage. If you recognize those names, you know we're entering the world of Fast and Furious. You do not need your 3D glasses quite yet, but it was a good impulse to have. You're gonna need them soon. So keep them handy. I'll let you know when the time comes. Please do remain seated. Hold on to your belongings. Hold on to your cell phones. Hold on to your loved ones. I have a feeling this is going to be a very bumpy ride. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's going on? Here's Roman. Buddy Hobbs asked us to stash you and show him for a while. He brought you in our secret spot. All right, look, guys, we're going to keep Shaw from finding you. We're going to keep you safe and lead you up. We don't want the syndicate tracking us here. So put away your cameras and turn off your cell phones. One flash or one ringtone can give us a one. I need y'all to take this real serious. Okay, pull into the next bay and meet you.
Guarantee my safety, I'm the one holding the gun. Yeah, but mine's a whole lot bigger than yours. Um, escort this and out this out. Let's go, Cookie Puss! You got an ugly suit on, man. It's cheap. Somebody out there really pissed off Shaw. It's gonna get ugly fast. Yeah, don't worry. Lucky for you, my whole family will protect you. Are you kidding me, Roman? You didn't shut off your phone, bro? I gotta call you back. I'm just not gonna go to Skype. See what I'm talking about? Call you back. Man. It was on vibrate. Shaw dressed us. I was kept on the road. Buddy. Roman, we're up. <sighs> Try to move that vehicle. It's about to get real interesting. The Mona Lisa's all warmed up right next door.